name's Daniel. Uh, I'm going to be leading worship for the next couple of weeks. I'm uh, really excited to be here. I'm glad that you guys have given me the opportunity. Do you mind if I open us up in prayer? No. All right. <laughs> and bow your heads. Lord, thank you for this day that you blessed us with, for this time together that you blessed us with to, to come and uh, that you've commanded us to come and worship you. And Lord, help us to make use of it and to really sing our hearts out here, Lord, and to remember that this is about you and that... Uh, uh, no matter where our hearts are or where our heads are, Lord, that at the end of the day, this is a sacrifice of worship and that we should give a, an able offering rather than a Cain one, Lord. So help us here and those in the congregation, help us just focus our hearts, Lord, help the spirit to move as you would have it and uh, help the service to go according to your will. And I pray this prayer in your awesome name. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all mind standing with me? So this first one's a bit new. I'm going to try to lead you on the chorus first, and then we'll go into the verses. All right. It's called His Mercy is More. Praise the Lord.
song was written by a man named William Cooper. He was a Methodist preacher back in the 18th century, give or take. Wrote hymns alongside John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. Uh, I did a project on him in college, and I was surprised to, to, to find what I, I did. I read his poetry, I read his hymns, they touched me deeply, but a lot of them seemed very troubled. And as I looked into his history, I, well, I found things I, I guess I wasn't expecting. He suffered with mental illness the entirety of his life, and it was profound. There were several occasions where he would wake up in the middle of the night screaming, and people would have to come hold him down because he was convinced that God was going to be sending them to hell. And throughout the entirety of his life, he struggled with this and never went away. And yet, when we look at the hymns that he wrote, these hymns where he's singing about the grace of God, the, the fountain of God's blood, and then he acknowledges his own worthlessness, his own lack of sufficiency, and, and when he says how his lisping, stammering tongue is still going to sing the praise of God, I think that we can take that, I think we can apply it to ourselves and relate to that, 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 that there are moments where we seem crazy, where we life seems crazy, where we seem insufficient, uh, but that's just a better opportunity to give God some worship. Because if, if a man like that could still devote his life to writing the hymns that he did, then we can give God glory in our own lives, wherever that would look. This next song is, is Come Thou Mount.
Good morning, WBC. Uh, I just wanted to give you an update on the upcoming uh, Montana mission trip. We will be leaving July 6th and returning July 12th. The Lord has called eight short-term missionaries to go, and I'll just list the uh, folks who are going. Uh, Jane, Janet Cowick, Warren Crossman, Drew Erb, Joseph Gainier, Joe Llewellyn, Shea Rivers, uh, Pastor Ricky Truesdale, and myself. We will again be partnering with the Western Prong Baptist Church in Whiteville, North Carolina, and their group is going to be close to 20. So that makes us 28 folks heading out to Montana to do God's work there. We will be returning to Belgrade to assist Pastor Curtis at the Bridge Church with VBS and Community Outreach, and some of the team will be going to the Belk Knapp 5 Reservation about five hours north of Belgrade near the Canadian border, and it is cold up there. So those folks who are going, pack some long johns. Okay. Um, and they will be going there to work with children on the reservation and also do some outreach for, in the community. We would appreciate your prayers and support. The team will also be doing a fundraiser on April 28th after church, so put that on the calendar. We are preparing a pulled pork meal, and there will be also be a bake sale and a Chinese auction. Thank you again, WBC, for all your past support of missions, and we are looking forward to what the Lord has for us to do on this trip. Thank you. Chris. Yes. Oh, thank you, Harry, for reminding me. <laughs> you notice he pointed to his head? Okay. There on Tuesday, on Thursday, so I'm glad you're here. On Thursday, there's going to be a senior dinner, luncheon. Okay. When? At 11:30. Thank you. You want to come up here and tell them about it? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good morning. Um, so Janet was originally going to speak about this, but she's not here today. So. We have an opportunity to serve the Baptist children homes in our community. We've uh, made April the collection month. Uh, Janet was giving me some facts about this and it's really kind of sobering. It says 20% of children in North Carolina are not properly fed. And North Carolina is number nine in the country for child hunger. So this means that their parents are either poor or they simply don't care enough to feed their children, or maybe even their orphans, and they don't have parents. So we want to challenge the church for this month to bring food items and toiletry items. Um, there was supposed to be some stuff in the back for like a list, but I couldn't find them this morning. So we'll have those probably next week of what you can bring, but pretty much any food, any basic needs that a child could use. Um, also, we're considering doing a one-day youth trip out to one of these children's homes. So just be praying about that, seeing if you know anybody that would want to do that. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can ask me. But Janet's the main person who's been organizing this. And as I was praying about talking about it, this um, the Lord gave me something he wanted me to say, and uh, I wrote it down here. So as we're gathering donations for the children this month, be in prayer for these kids and ask the Holy Spirit to change their lives because he was show, showing me like all the times in Jesus' time where he, he would give, like he, he only had two loaves of bread and he fed thousands with it. And also the, the verses in the Bible that say, you know, God, he gives his body, which is like the everlasting bread. And when he gave the water to the woman at the well, it, that's like an overflowing wellspring that can like overflow into other people's lives. So while we can provide them basic stuff, you know, food and supplies, that could just provide for them for maybe one day or several weeks. But just pray that the Lord would fill their lives, that they would be transformed and would know Jesus and would take that to their families as well. So uh, Another thing, uh, we have scripture memory on Wednesday. So if you know any youth that between probably 8 and 18, 
we have a great time at Mr. Jim's barn every other, um, well, it's once every month on the second week. So let me say that again. Once every month, second Wednesday of every month. Just be in prayer for that. If you know anybody, we have a great time. So thank you. Children's Church can be dismissed at this time. Is it hot in here? Will you go turn the air on for me, please, Anthony? <laughs> Thank you. You know what? I think, I think last week when I said, are you all awake, I think you all were asleep because it was too hot in here, right? <laughs> but it's good to see you this morning. Let me thank you for being here. It's great to be in the house of the Lord, to be able to worship him through song uh, and through his word, through fellowship. A um, lot going on here at the church. Thank you, Joseph, for uh, filling in that gap. Rich, for bringing us up to date on the mission trip. Uh, there's just a lot of things going on. So uh, let me just remind you why we're doing this. Is that uh, if you have not given us your email or your phone number... Please call Janet to do that because probably the 1st of May we're getting ready to go to the One Call Now system, which is how we're going to communicate through the church. The One Call Now system will give you a phone call, it will give you an email, and it will give you a text. So uh, that's the way that we're going to probably end up uh, getting in contact with everyone. So if you're wanting to know what's going on with the church, please call Janet and give her your email and your phone number. For, uh, don't forget about the business meeting next week at 5 p.m. Uh, hope to see you here. We'll be uh, conducting the business of the church, so please come. Uh, two other things before I get started. Jules and Connie, happy anniversary tomorrow. So I uh, hope you, you guys have a great anniversary, and Doug, it's good to see you back, and we continue to lift you up, you and Sue, and uh, uh, great to have you back, and, and I know that that's been uh, uh, a trial, uh, uh, but also I know the Lord has worked through that too. So uh, it's good to be in the Lord's house. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, praise team, uh, for leading us in worship. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16. That's where we're going to be, just in the first two verses. I want to speak to you this morning, and I'm just going to introduce this subject this morning about the blessing of giving, the blessing of giving. In the last business meeting we had, I had a challenge uh, from several folks on the floor uh, to teach about the blessings of giving. And so over the next several weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about. And that new, you know, the new series is called The Blessing of Giving, right? Uh, probably be a six-part series, and within that series, we're going to talk about the vision of Waxhaw Baptist Church, of WBC. So please try to be here. Uh, don't miss it. Uh, we're excited about where we're going and what's happening in the church how we get there. Uh, we'll see how the Lord takes us and where he guides us to, but please uh, come and, and be a part of that. The series is focused on giving sacrificially to the Lord's kingdom. That's what it's all about. This first part, we're going to examine the system of giving, the system of giving, and how the church has been set up to give to the kingdom's advancement. You might be sitting there thinking, what I give is up to me. It's none of your business, Chris. Well, you know what? I'll get to that. I barely have enough in the, eco in the economy we're in even to give. Great, great insight. The church has enough in its savings to cover all the lights, the powers, the needs, and everything else. 
We don't need to change in any way, shape, or form. What we have is sufficient. I knew I shouldn't have come today because all the church is interested in is my money. <laughs> oh, no, it's going to be a prosperity gospel type of sermon because the pastor needs a raise, a new jet airplane, or whatever it may be. Right? Right? I think I covered most of the worries and the anxiousnesses and the excuses in all of that. First of all, let me inform you about something which you may not know. As the lead pastor here at WBC, I have no idea what you give. I stay out of the finances. I, I don't have any idea what any of you give unless you tell me so. I have, an overall, uh, I have an overall total of the gifts given each month just like you do because of the statements that are given to us every month. And I do know pastors who know what every elder, deacon give on a monthly basis and they know what a lot of their members give because they make that part of their ministry. Like I said, I choose not to do that. That's not my concern. I don't because it is between you and the Lord. I agree with you. It is between you and the Lord. And we're going to learn about this in this series. Talking about money in the church is an awkward conversation, isn't it? It's really an awkward conversation because of all of those things we just talked about. But it really should not be an awkward conversation. The word charges us as believers to give to the work of the kingdom. If, you're not, uh, if you don't give to the work of the kingdom, you're missing out on a blessing. I'm not talking about the giving of time or talents. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about giving financially to the kingdom. Part of the work is the local church, which one is a member of. And part of the work is giving to other parts of the work of the ministries of the kingdom. It's a spiritual issue. Whether we really want to look at it or not, it's a spiritual issue. It is our giving back to God for the works that he wants his church to do in the community, the nation, and the world. He wants his church to reflect who he is in her member's life plus being an example of where he ranks in our Christian life. We as believers need to give so we can experience what giving does for us. And what does it do for us? It transforms us. Whether we know it or not, it transforms us. So here's the bottom line, and I like what Carrie Newoff, who was a, a lead pastor for many years, said. He said, until Jesus is first in your finances, Jesus is not first in anything in your life. Pretty bold statement, isn't it? Makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? <laughs> In fact, he goes in and he, he, he says, you're not a follower of Christ, you're a user like Judas. Mm. Wow. Boy, that hits to the heart, doesn't it? We don't like it. In fact, maybe some of you have already turned me off this morning. I don't know. But I hope that you haven't. You see, anything you have has been given to you by the Lord. You have nothing. I have nothing. It's all the Lord's. Everything that you have in your life belongs to the Lord's. You're just stewards of it. I'm just stewards of it. You're supposed to be good stewards of what he's given you. Timothy Keller, in a talk he gave at a generous giving gathering stated this. Nobody thinks they're greedy. Do y'all think you're greedy? 
Nobody in all of my years of ministry has claimed this. I have heard almost every kind of confession, but nobody has ever come to me and said, I spend too much money on myself. (laughs) Nobody has ever done that. Here is what I want you to consider. If Jesus talks about greed and materialism 10 to 20 times more than he talks about other sins... And he says nobody ever thinks that they are part of this greed. Then we should start with a working hypothesis that it's probably a problem for me. If we want a culture of generosity in the church, we must own up to this. Giving is a special issue in a Christian's life. In surveys across the nation, it was found that many believers give 2.5% or less of their income on a monthly basis to the local church they belong to. Out of these believers, there's a thinking that the giving of time replaces the giving of money. While the giving of time can be and is a sacrifice... It doesn't replace the fact of giving back to God financially. The giving of time does not keep the lights on, the budgets balanced, the ministries running, the mission outreaches, and so on. So over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be studying this blessing of giving. We're going to look at the heart of giving. We're going to look at the spirit of giving. We're going to look at the substance of giving. And we're going to look at the standard of giving. Maybe not necessarily in that order. But those are the things that we're going to look at. And within this series, I'm going to bring the vision of WBC for the future. We're going to look at the history of WBC. We're going to look at the mission of WBC. We're going to look at the visions of WBC. And then we're going to look at the needs of WBC. So that we can all be on the same page of where the Lord wants to take us and what he wants us to do as his local church in this community. Then we'll need to come together and we're going to have to talk about the direction this church needs to follow for the future generations. We can stay the same, that's stagnant. That's not moving. You all know what stagnant water looks like, right? What happens to it after a period of time? It dries up, right? There's that green film all on it and everything else. Or we can flow, we can grow, and we can make an impact of giving this thirsty community a drink of living water. For as long as I've been here, for those of you who know me, I've been saying this for the last 12, 13 years That Waxall is coming this way. It's already hopped the track. You can go that way, you can go that way, you can go that way, or you can go that way. And you're going to see new houses that are being built and new families that are coming in. And you know what? There's a need. And we need to fill that need. We don't need to stay stagnant. So be praying how we can be a part of this opportunity. Now, how did the system of giving originate in the New Testament? Have you ever looked at that? What does it look like and what are we supposed to learn by it? Well, there's five questions we've got to answer concerning this system of giving. And Paul gives it to us. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now, you know that the, first, or the Corinthian church was all messed up, right? I mean, you know what? You go into the, the first couple chapters and they're all fighting about who they're following. I'm, I'm for Paul. I'm, I'm for Peter. I'm for Apollos. And none of them said that they were for who? Jesus Christ. It's his church. You see, we're for Jesus Christ. We're not for the person in the pulpit. We're for 
the person that's at the right hand of God who is Jesus Christ. That's who we're for. And that's what Paul spends the next several chapters on. And then he starts addressing some moral issues in the church. And then he starts addressing uh, daily life in the church about marriage and singleness and, and so on. And then he comes to what? Chapter 15. And we talked about it, you know, some last week about the resurrection that, that our faith is not in vain because Jesus won the victory, that he overcame death, that he gave us the example of how we should live, how we should die, and what's on the other side, right? And he comes into verse 58 and he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And I think that's pretty interesting because he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about Jesus' victory. He's talking about our victory. And then he goes right into practical application in, in 16.1. And he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia to do, you also, on the first day of the week, or on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collection be made when I come. That's the only two verses we're going to look at. Okay? I think it's interesting that in verse 58, he's saying, hey, beloved, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And now he comes in and he's going to start talking to them about what? Offerings, about the money to the church. That's what he's going to start talking to them about. So what's the first truth here? Well, the first truth, it's a simple truth. It's where do we give? Where are we supposed to give to? Well, Paul says now concerning the collection. So what's the collection? It's the act of gathering something. And what Paul's talking about there is the contribution of money. Awkward. Right? It's awkward. But not to the first century church. The first century church knew that this was part of the discipline of living for Christ. And they were eager to learn and they were eager to help. Paul was answering a question of where do we give and he's saying you give to the church. You give to your local body of believers. If you're a member of the church, you give to it. And we'll break this down in the, in the days to come, okay? I'm not going to get all, into all of that this morning. But in the, in the weeks to come, we'll, we'll, we'll break this down a little bit more. The church was taking up a collection to what? To help the saints. Where were the saints? They were in Jerusalem. The, the church was centered in, in the metropolitan area of Jerusalem. That's where the help was needed because everybody was coming in for the Passover. Everybody was coming in to celebrate it. There were poor people there, and the church was going to what? Outreach to them and help them. So at that point in time, all the, a lot of the money was going to the Jerusalem church. Paul laid out a system for giving within the local church, though, and we missed that because... Uh, we see in the scripture, and we'll answer it here in a minute, about how that local church came together to give their money. He's already put it in Galatia, right? He said, do just like the people in Galatia do. This is the way you should approach it. So what do we see? We're starting to see a skeleton of budgets, whether we think about it or not, about where we're going to give this money and where it goes to. Paul was laying out the structure of what the church does with their money. The money is for missions. Isn't that what he said? Right. 
we're going to take this money and we're going to give it to over here to help God's people in Jerusalem. For us today, this would be like benevolence offering or maybe even a missions offering of some sort. More benevolence than a mission, I'd probably say, because what are they trying to do? We're trying to give them money to help them buy food, seek shelter, whatever it may be. Okay? We have a budget for both. If you look on our budget, we, we have a budget for both of these. That's part of what? Giving to the local church so that we can do these things. Or we can take up a voluntary offering. We've done that before, right? We, somebody was in need or we're sending a missionary off or whatever it is, we what? We take up a voluntary offering for them to what? Meet their needs. Or just like with Joseph when he came up here about the children's home and the food. You know what? That's voluntary. That's, hey, let's come together as a church, meet this need, and send it off. So there's several ways to approach it. And then number two, Paul, uh, we ask, when do we give? Well, Paul says it. On the first day of every week, second, in the second verse, on the first day of every week we give. Well, when was the first day? The rose, I mean, the Lord rose on the first day of the week, right? That was Resurrection Sunday. So the giving should be collected on the first day of the week, hence... Offerings, tithe box, however it is, that's when it should be given. Because this is when the newly church, the newly formed church met for corporate wor worship. That's why we meet on Sunday mornings. You know why? In their day, they could, either, they could meet on Sunday mornings or Sunday nights. Why? Because most of them worked. But they still met. On the first day of the week. I want you to notice that Paul never used the word tithe in these two scriptures. I want you to notice that. And we'll talk about that later on in the, in the series. But Paul never used tithe as the word and that it was required It emphasizes giving out of love for God and his people. That's what it emphasizes. Thirdly, who gives? Who's supposed to give? Okay. Well, what's he say? On the first day of, the, of every week, each one, each one gives. Each one. Each person should give back to the Lord for the work, uh, for his work to be done. Everyone, each individual Christian, individually should be giving back. Why is that? Because what you have, you should appreciate. And if you appreciate where you received it from, which was from the Lord, that you give back to him. So Paul was challenging each Christian, each Christian family to put away money to help the kingdom, right? He said the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that collections be made when I come. Justin Martyr in his first Apology, which is a defense, writes this. All the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep together, and for all things wherewith we are supplied. We bless the maker of all things through his son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit. And on Sunday, all who lives in cities or in the country gather together to uh, one place and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. Now you say, well, wait just a second. He said the wealthy. 
He said, you know what, Chris, the wealthy among us. Well, can I tell you that each one in here is more wealthier than two-thirds of the world? You have more money than probably two-thirds of the world. So, you know what, the excuse of, oh, that's the riches. They're supposed to be the ones. No. Paul says each one, each individual is what he says. So we have the where do we give, the when do we give, the who gives, and now, fourthly, the what of giving, the what of giving. Well, the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save and he, as he may prosper. Each man as he may prospers. Now, we're really going to get into that next week, if I'm not mistaken. And we're going to talk about that. And what does that mean as each man prospers? There's not a certain amount required. You hear me? There's not a certain amount required in giving. <gasps> That's not what I've been told. That's not what I've been taught either. I was a Baptist for, uh, I still am, <laughs> ever since I was little, okay? And I've always heard 10%, 10%, 10%. 10%. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about where that came from, and then we'll talk about what the New Testament requires from us. He says each man throughout the week would uh, put aside something, whatever that is. Whatever that something is, whether that's a dollar, whether that was a day's wage, and, and you put some extra behind it, Whatever it may have been. Paul didn't put a number on it. I want you to look at that and see. He didn't say, hey, Chris, you need to give $400. No. He didn't say, hey, Chris, you need to give two cents. Whatever that man prospers and sets aside for the week. Then on the first day of the week, a collection would be taken up. Here's the whole thing. No one was compared to anyone else. <laughs> well, I know they got money. How come they're not giving? I give everything I got. And you know what? They've got all kind of money, and they're not giving anything. It's none of your business. That's between them and the Lord. That's between you and the Lord. There is a requirement to give. I want you to look at that. I mean, there is a requirement to give. But how much is between you and the Lord? The collection was taken up from God's people to meet the needs. That's us why we do it you know I, I would challenge you are you a part of it and then number five why give why because God gives all things to man don't be like I said don't be so prideful to think that what you have you did it on your own because you you haven't I haven't. God has given that to us. And I'll just give you a little blurb for next week. You can't outgive God. And I, I, I challenge you to do it. I challenge you to do it. I read a story of a businessman who was a Christian, a new Christian. And he heard 
a pastor preach about God's generosity and that you couldn't out give him. And so he took up that challenge. He said, I started off with 10%. That's what I always heard. And then you know what? I, I started giving him 20%. And, 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 and every time I upped my tithe, and he upped it all the way up to like 60 70%, he said, God returned it back to me. Now, that's not prosperity gospel, y'all. I'm not, I'm not sitting here talking about prosperity gospel. I'm just talking about the blessings of giving and the obedience to God. And I'll share some stories with you about folks who's worked through these things. I will share mine and Laura's story with you about how you can't outgive him. God requires a generous heart according to man's prosperity. If man prospers, he should show it through the giving back to the Lord. If you're prosperous, what does that mean? Are you prosperous? Hope so. You, you make money, you're retired, whatever it is. Are you prosperous? If you are, then you should show it. In different ways. There's different ways. But I'm just starting with the church first. Because this is the local body of believers. How it was set up. If it's a lean year, maybe that man's giving is a little less. Does that mean that he's not giving? No. It's to each one. What's Matthew 6, 19, 22 say? Do not store up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hmm. Well, now I'm going to have to go like the rich young ruler and go sell everything, right? No, that's not what God is requiring of you. God doesn't say that you have to go sell everything and, and give him everything. No. You know what? He blesses us in different ways. He, he, he blesses us with the money that we have. And there's nothing wrong with taking that money and uh, living life and enjoying life. What, what is wrong is this. What's wrong is when you don't sit down and, and ask him how much you need to give out of what he's given you for the work of his kingdom. That's what's wrong. So you know what? We see in these first few verses of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, it's the first structure of church finances. That's what it is. We don't, we don't look at that. We don't compare that a lot of times. We don't think about it. We just say, oh, look, they're giving money. But they had to have what? A systematic way to do that. And if you read on... Paul says this. He said, pick two people from your congregation to take the money, and they can go with me. That's called trusting the people in the church with your money. Not your money. It's really God's money. Okay? So I didn't even get to that point. But when you go in there and you see it, Paul says, hey, I go. they can go with me, or you can send them on. Uh, because we're going to make sure that that money is spent wisely and given to the Jerusalem church. That's important. It's important to be able to have that voice, like we do as a local congregation, and to trust the leaders where the money's going because that's part of it. Where to give, when to give, 
who is giving, the what of giving, and why of giving. Generosity is like weightlifting. Uh oh, I'm already in trouble, right? If you start lifting 30 pound reps, one third of your body weight, when you're still 100 pounds, you are going to have a much easier time lifting larger and larger weights as time progresses. If you wait until you make it close to 300 pounds without working out, lifting 100-pound reps, still one-third of your body, is going to be much harder to start with. Now, if you reach 300 pounds by lifting weights, 100-pound repetitions on barbells are not only going to be easy, but they are also going to what? Feel good. The same is true for generosity. If we practice sharing uh, generosity when we have little, it becomes a habit that increases along with the gifts the Lord gives us. It's interesting. It's called practice. It's what it's called. That's all it is. That's the whole term. You see, in the blessings of giving, we see the Word of God giving His church the structure of how to give. We see how He intends to use the local body through the Sunday morning offerings of each individual who give according to their means through a generous heart to move the kingdom forward. That's what we're here for, right? That's worship. Offering to the Lord, money, offering your money, your resources to the Lord. That's worship. It's not just coming up and singing. It's not just hearing the word. It's not just fellowshipping or going out and evangelizing. It's worship when you give the resources that God has given you back to Him. It can be plainly seen that members of the local church should be supporting the church they're a part of for the kingdom of God. Sometimes we have to take little steps, such as the body building, to get where we need to get in giving. Don't know where you're at in the process. Shouldn't be an awkward conversation, right? If Jesus is our Lord and Savior, it shouldn't be an awkward conversation that we're having over these next several weeks. I don't want it to be. But I want want you to see what the Lord's Word says about what we should be doing as a local body of believers and how we should approach that. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about Uh, You know what? How we can do different things in that too as individuals. So I don't know where you're at this morning. Uh, Maybe you're, you built a wall up already and you're like, oh boy, these next three or four weeks, I'm just going to bring me earplugs, right? Or maybe you've built up a little wall about this high and and you're going to use that as a stumbling block, You're going to stumble over that because, you know what, that's too sensitive, that's too personal. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've forgotten. Yeah, you know what, I wouldn't have the things I have unless the Lord gave them to me. I don't know what you need to do this morning. I don't know if you need to repent. I don't know if you need to pray and ask God to continue to open your heart and your mind. I don't know if you need to go home and study a little bit about this. I don't know. But I know that the Holy Spirit speaks to each one of us individually. And I also know that when he does that, that as Christians, we're supposed to be obedient in whatever he's leading us to do. So as the praise team comes, as Daniel and the praise team comes, I just ask that you would just have your heart open and do what the Lord may want you to do. If you need to come to the altar, you can pray. If you need to speak to me, you can pray with me. Be glad to. Or you can pray right where you're at. But as we close this time out,
Let's just worship the Lord, the audience of one. Would you stand with me? How deep the Father's love for us. Thank you for being here today. What a great day to be in the Lord's house. Just thank each one of you for, for coming. I just ask that you would just lift up those who uh, are not in good health, who may be in the hospital today, who, who are uh, taking treatments, who've, who's come off of treatments, uh, whatever it may be, just continue to lift up your brothers and sisters in the faith. Uh, there's always somebody to be, pray, to, to be prayed for, right? We always should be lifting up. Lift up the leadership of this church. Lift up your Sunday school teachers and everyone else and all the ministries. Because you know what? There's one reason. There's one reason that God has always put on my heart that this church needs to put in the forefront. It's all about Him. You know what? It's not about me. It's not about, it's all about him. And when we do that, then we can see a mighty work by the hand of God in the church's life and in our lives. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness, your goodness, your gentleness, your love, joy, your peace. Father, I just thank you that we could come together and just learn more about your word and the blessings of giving. As we leave this place today, Lord, may we ponder upon that. May we ponder upon what you have given us that we need to give back to you. 
And then in the coming days, Lord, may you open our hearts up to see what you're wanting to do here at WBC. So, Father, I just pray that you would just uh, bless each and every one here, put a shield of protection around them, give them the peace that surpasses all understanding. And, Lord, then as we leave this place too, let us be the salt and the light and let us tell others about you. So we just thank you and we just praise you. For it's in Jesus' wonderful, powerful, blessed name we pray. Amen.